Good evening. I'm Kim Brooks, the Dean here at the Schulich School of Law. It's a pleasure to see so many friends in one room and a few new faces among them. Uh, welcome to uh, part of our mini law series. This is part of um, our effort at the law school to actually engage with a broader range of people on legal issues of current importance in the community and tonight's mini law lecture will be no exception to that. When you have a dream about what the best law school would be, for me anyway, it's one of those places that you want to come to because there's all kinds of great ideas and people are talking about interesting things and so that was part of the motivation behind this series and I hope if you haven't been to one of these before that you'll use this as a jumping off point to come to others on topics that you're interested in over the rest of this year. Uh, it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce you to Sheila Wildman, one of my colleagues here at the law school. Uh, she's currently serving as our Associate Director of our Health Law Institute. She does work in administrative law, human rights, mental health law, and jurisprudence, among other topics. She is a prolific scholar, and if something distinguishes or marks the kind of work that she does, it's the collaborative nature of the work she does and her ability to work well with people in other disciplines. So she's often writing pieces with uh, other practitioners and, and professionals in the um, health professions uh, parts of the world, uh, both in academia and beyond. And in addition to that, as a colleague, I particularly appreciate her because she's got this wide-ranging creative mind. And so she's always interesting to talk to. She always brings new ideas to the table that I haven't thought about. And so it really is just lovely to have her here at the school, and I'm sure you will enjoy her as I do this evening. Thanks for coming out, and I'm really, I really welcome the opportunity to talk to you know such a um, it's quite big and <laughs> uh, diverse audience tonight about uh, something that's quite close to my heart, uh, the topic of uh, legal capacity, as I will short form it, uh, decision making capacity at law, quite a complex topic um, and a uh, politically as well as personally um, important and uh, sometimes deeply contested uh, topic. Um, so I want to start with a person, with this notion of person-centeredness, hopefully, you know, driving the law on capacity and our thinking um, on these topics. So this is a woman named Jenny Hatch, and some of you may have come across this story. It uh, kind of hit the news last summer, and it's a U.S. story. It happened in Virginia. Um, but it's made quite a splash internationally since the court case that um, uh, Jenny Hatch was involved in was decided. And I'll tell you a little bit about it to get us started. So Jenny Hatch, again, uh, lives in Virginia, and she's a 29-year-old woman uh, with Down syndrome. She just won quite a legal victory. This is back in uh, August of uh, this year <clears throat> in opposing an application that her parents brought to a court in Virginia um, for guardianship. And this was um, a request for what you might call plenary guardianship for a full set of decision-making powers in relation to Jenny's life. So they wanted, in particular, to have decision-making authority over where she lived. And in particular, they wanted her in a group home. They felt that was safest for her. She had got into a bicycle accident. Uh, late one night, and that was one of the uh, determinants of their worries. Um, they also wanted decision-making authority about her medical treatment and about who she could see or have relationships with. Um, what uh, happened in that court case was an order for limited guardianship, which went not to her parents, um, but to these two people, who aren't actually Jenny's um, parents. It sounds like she has a, a difficult relationship um, with her mother and her mother's um, second uh, husband, but also it's a complex story, and they've had a, a long uh, relationship of supporting Jenny, her, uh, her uh, biological mother has. But these folks um, own a thrift store that Jenny worked at for four years or just over that um, amount of time before this court case um, arose. And Jenny had been in group homes, uh, living in group homes for a year or more prior to the court application. She'd been running away from the group homes. Uh, she wasn't happy there. She was really happy with these folks who uh, run a thrift store and employ people with disabilities. Um, they have a swimming pool. They have fun at their place. And she spent a lot of time there uh, with people that she liked. And they said, yeah, you can, you can live with us and we're willing, 
um, to do what we can to secure your safety. So what happened in the eventuality of the court case was they were um, granted, these folks, what I said, it's a temporary guardianship order of one year, and it was a limited order in that it didn't extend to all areas of Jenny's life. It was specific to medical decisions and what the judge put as safety decisions, still a little bit broad. Um, but the, uh, the thing that the judge added in uh, his order, which made a big splash in the disability rights uh, community in the U.S. and internationally, was he mandated that this couple support Jenny through this time of their temporary guardianship, support and enable her decision-making capacities during that time. What does that mean? They were, this is what is being celebrated that rather than simply being given sort of uh, as, a, as a lump sort of award uh, the authority to make decisions on behalf of Jenny, uh, they've been mandated to support her decision-making capacities with a, an eye to her um, remo the, the removal of the guardianship order at the end of the... So this is just impossible for you to read whether or not uh, your uh, you know, eyes are able to process what's up here, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. I wasn't sure how best to capture this, and perhaps what I can do is put these PowerPoint slides um, on our website so that you can go back, and they'll be flashing lots of things at you that you may or may not want to write down, but let me assure you that you can go back and find this stuff, and, and in fact, all of this is on a website I'm going to refer you to in a second. So this is Jenny Hatch's writing, and I'm going to read it to you. She says, my name is Jenny Hatch. Uh, I am 29 years old, and I have Down syndrome. Last year, I was placed in a group home. I did not want to be there. I told everyone that I was not happy and did not like it. I just wanted to go home to my friends, Jim and Kelly's. So those are the folks who you just saw in the picture. Uh, Jewish Family Services, this was the agency uh, running the group homes, was my, was my guardian. Says. Uh, and then it's blanked out, was my caseworker. She was mean to me, she yelled, and uh, I was not, uh, sorry, she yelled at me and even hit me. I was not allowed to go to my job at the thrift store. I worked there for almost five years. I wasn't allowed to have my friends or co-workers visit or even call me. I wasn't allowed to have my cell phone or computer. I felt like a prisoner, but I didn't do anything wrong. Now, this is, the story continues. I was told I had rights at the group homes, but that wasn't true. JFS, the agency, took them away. It was like I didn't matter, like I didn't exist. JFS took away my rights, my choices, my independence. A guardian is supposed to help me reach my goals. Instead, I was kept away from my community, my church, and my friends. I kept telling everyone I was unhappy, but no one listened to me. And here's the end. I lost a year of my life being forced to stay in group homes and forced to work at a job I did not want. And it says how, but the words who. Who is making sure that what happened to me doesn't happen to someone else? Who is making sure that JFS is doing the right thing? Just because people have a disability does not mean they need a guardianship. Many times they may need just a little help. And she says, thank you, Jenny Hatch. So that was her, um, you know, her own words of uh, uh, what had happened in the recent years. And with the um, court uh, victory in her case, and it was supported by the American Civil Liberties Union um, and uh, uh, a particular lawyer's uh, name is... Uh, Whoops, where is he? Yeah, Joseph Mar uh, jo Jonathan Martinez, uh, the lawyer who's you can see in the picture uh, there. Um, she managed to make the win that she did. I was just going to read you a couple, um, a couple of more things. So Susan uh, uh, Misner, who is uh, disability counsel for the ACLU, um, said this just in commenting on. Jenny's win that has invoked quite a, a response, again, nationally and internationally. This website, this is actually the uh, home page for a website that was just set up this week, um, telling this story and giving resources to folks who are interested in this idea of supported decision making um, and other resources around guardianship practices in all of the states in the U.S.
S. So Susan Mitzner, who was disability counsel involved in the case, said, um, commenting on the ideals behind it, I guess, she said, we all grow, learn, function best when we're given increasing responsibility and opportunities to make decisions for ourselves. Guardianship is imposed on people with disabilities with some level of functioning as Jenny uh, has, with the same level of functioning as Jenny has all the time, and they're not given a chance to show they can make decisions. So that was her comment, and uh, Jonathan Martinez, who was her lawyer, said something similar. She said, you know, we go, he said, we go to the mechanic, you know, when our car sounds a little funny, and the mechanic might say, you know, the valves are, the timing's off, we need to replace a valve. We say, at least I would, you know, explain that to me like I'm a five-year-old. Tell me, you know, work with me here. I, I don't understand how my car works. I can drive it, but explain it to me. And when I do that, said Martinez, you know, I'm engaging in supported decision-making. When I do it, I'm being smart. I'm getting the information I need to make decisions, right, in the form that I can understand. But when people with disabilities need support, he said, um, people assume they can't do anything else. Okay, so that's the, just the, the background that I wanted to, to, to give you as we think through these difficult questions of legal capacity. So the title of my talk, What Does It Take to Be legal, Legally Capable? Um, I'm focusing, as it suggests in my title and it's suggested in the stuff that went out before my talk, I'm focusing on decisions about health care and personal care, and that's for a lot of reasons. You'll see in a second that just even focusing on those is super complicated. Uh, if we're going to try to unpack what the law looks like in Nova Scotia, um, so I'm leaving out a really important area of decision making, which is decisions about property and finance. Okay, so I want to be really clear about that. That's not part of my talk, and, but. That's not to say it isn't super important. So I'm going to start with some background principles and values, what is often characterized in the disability community as a paradigm shift that's been uh, kind of upswelling in the last decade or so, away from substitute decision making and toward supported decision making, which was the topic I was just referring to. Second, I want to give you a snapshot of the laws um, relating to decision-making capacity in Nova Scotia, in particular decisions about health and personal care. And then um, if I get to it, I have just a few slides because this is really important too, in terms of the consequences of a determination of incapacity to make a particular decision. Um, there are some laws in Nova Scotia that are quite particular about what a substitute decision-maker must consider when making decisions on behalf of another. So I wanted to give you a taste um, of that. And my watchwords there I come back to my theme, which is a substitute decision maker, even crafted as such in Nova Scotia law, should still be animated by the values of support, right? Um, so one should strive to be supportive, responsive, and responsible, no matter what the law looks like. OK. so. Back to uh, real world stuff, there are a variety of conditions, a variety of circumstances, right? Uh, phenomena internal in some sense to the person as well as external to the person, and we know these are interactive dimensions, right? That may impair decision making. And I've listed a few that came to my mind here, right? And it's sometimes tough. Um, Addressing this topic, I started with right, Jenny's story, a person with Down, so we start to think in a particular way about the situation of someone whose legal capacity may be challenged, but of course there's a whole other set of stories, and many of you here in the audience will be deeply familiar with the other contexts and stories out of which issues of legal capacity may arise. So I'm just listing these in part to remind uh, all of us about the variety and complexity of ways that these legal issues um, can arise. But none of those conditions that I've just listed are the same as legal incapacity. All right? So the law is doing something a little different 
than, say, a health professional is doing when they make a particular diagnosis. There's something else going on in the law, and that's part of what I'm trying to convey to you tonight. It's complex, right? Someone in one of the uh, reactions to my, the title of my talk prior to this week asked, are we going to hear about whether there's a common standard of legal capacity across Canada? So my short answer to that one is no. <laughs> I mean, you're going to hear that there isn't one. Let's put it that way. So legal capacity, as I say in the first bullet, is defined differently in law across jurisdictions, so in different provinces, but also um, in relation to different types of decision made in any single jurisdiction. So the law is fragmented. You might think of it as a big broken vase or something if there was some ideal of what it is to be capable of making a decision. Um, that shattered a long time ago as law attempted to craft um, rules and guidance to us um, applicable to particular contexts in which those questions had arisen. So it's defined differently. It's complex. It's... Uh, uh, there are multiple definitions of legal capacity, and I'll give you a taste of how that looks in Nova Scotia in a second. It also reflects political choices. So it's not just about, again, an inherent condition that the law is trying to sort of map onto perfectly. There are political choices being made when the concept of legal capacity is defined at law. So we can think more about that. And these political choices, it's not just about interest groups battling, you know, I, my interests will be served by this definition, yours by that definition, although there's some of that in politics necessarily, right? Um, but the definitions of legal capacity that we have, well, I say there, they reflect our core values as a society. That's actually the question. They should. They should reflect our core values as a society in a way that we find acceptable, right? So, and this includes this, you know, just to finish off that uh, bullet, our aspirations for the sorts of relationships that we want to build in our society. So among family members, like the sorts who might be bound up in some guardianship uh, orders and other forms of uh, decision-making at law, um, and among strangers as well. Okay. What's in a decision? <laughs> Again, my background stuff, but I, I still, I'm, I'm still wrestling to not flatten the complexity of what we're talking about by putting up all my bullets with uh, uh, statements of, of what the law um, says or doesn't say. So I've got, you know, wh okay, what's in a decision? What is a decision? You can say, well, what's a decision to us? I think we would all agree that making decisions for ourselves, in some sense, for ourselves, is very important to us. Right? It's, it's really important to be able to decide where I'm going to live, who I'm going to live with. Right? It's even kind of important to me often, I'm sitting in a restaurant, I want to be able to decide right, whether my eggs are hard-boiled or scrambled. That's gotta, I, there, there's an importance to that too. The clothes I'm going to wear. You know, those of us who had conflicts with our parents growing up about, you know, what kind of clothes we were going to, that was really, it was important to our identity and to our develop to, to make these decisions. So there's a lot going on in a decision when it comes to its, uh, its place in, in our personal value systems, right? But what's in a decision is also a question we can look at in terms of what does it take to make a decision? Um, and that's another right question. Well, and I'll get to that uh, uh, in part in my next slide, but there's, there's emotional components to decisions. One might, and I've got, I don't know if it's Godzilla or what down here, just, you know, I make decisions in part sometimes out of anger or out of love, right? Um, I make decisions because I want to help others or I want to establish a relationship with them or maybe I want to set boundaries, right? Sometimes there's a and I don't know what the heck this is, something the Vatican or I don't know what, but there may be a spiritual element to the decisions uh, that we make, right? Sometimes it seems sort of trivial, the decisions that we make, but there may be a lot of weighing of pros and cons, right? Costs and benefits. This is someone trying to decide, is he going to complete his class assignment or not? You know, there's pros, there's cons. There's the weighing of pros and cons. There's the visualizing of risks and benefits, right? It's drawing on our background values and experiences and memories. 
It's a lot of cognitive and emotional, but also um, relational elements to decision making. And this, you know, here's a group of decision makers conferring and consulting. It's like me and the mechanic what have you. It's not necessarily that solo project that we sometimes think about decision making as, as we wrestle in this angsty way with what we should do. And just a last, you know, background slide on this um, point. We shouldn't fall into the trap of, uh, I suppose, conceiving of the baseline, you know, sort of the norm for decision making as a thoroughly rational enterprise. So neuroscience and cognitive science is much preoccupied these days with exposing the sorts of cognitive biases and errors that typically inform the decisions that we make, right? Whether it be overvaluing ourselves or being over, you know, optimistic about results, right? Here's a guy who's got his lotto ticket and says, I know the last five scratch-off tickets didn't win, which means this next one must be a winner. There's a whole set... You know, here's uh, folks going into a movie theater. The one says, an inconvenient truth. The other says, a reassuring lie. Okay, I'm going to rely on that one. The kind of, you know, confirming of biases that we already have through the questions that we ask or what we pay attention to when we make a decision. So this uh, here says, uh, everything you look for and all that you perceive has a way of proving whatever you believe. So... All of that has to, I think, be thrown into the mix as we get into this topic of how law constructs decision-making capacity, which is a baseline, minimal construction in order to enter into the world of one who is authorized to make decisions for oneself. Okay, so last bits of background. But I did say that decision-making capacity is defined not in a way that tries to simply, you know, map onto, uh, say, a neuroscientist's understanding of what it is to make a decision, or an ethicist's understanding necessarily. But there is uh, certainly in all law and in law's definitions of legal capacity or decision-making capacity as well, a reflection of fundamental values and a weighing of those values against each other sometimes and against... Uh, certain limits on those values that we come up against often in law, right? Whether we're legislators or we're judges or we're people just trying to make a decision that accords with the law, right? So two fundamental values that inform decision-making capacity laws and our evaluations and applications of them um, are values that are stated in our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So our Bill of Rights, which is supreme law in this country sets out a whole right, uh, slew of values and, and rights, fundamental rights guarantees. Um, but one of them is the right to liberty. I've used the word autonomy there. This is the one that just comes more naturally to me. But this is the right of self-determination. We could have lots of talks about you know, what is liberty, freedom from, or freedom to. Um, but certainly, uh, the idea of respecting persons um, ability to make important life choices for themselves is one of those animating values that has shaped our law and our, our legal tradition. Equality, another fundamental value, which we have to keep our eye on when we look at the ways that legal capacity is defined and applied. Does it have disproportionate burdening impacts on some people and not others? Right? We're all equipped with these cognitive biases <laughs> and common errors that we make, but are some people getting caught out for those sorts of biases and errors, whether self-aggrandizement or what have you, while others are not? Um, counterweights on those values include, as I've got that right, protection of the vulnerable. So if someone is not equipped to look after their own interests and their own safety, then that's of concern to us of a, as a community. And that's uh, one of the values on which our laws are also uh, constructed. And also there's the use of scarce resources comes into play, particularly for, uh, for instance in, uh, well, some areas of health law, including mental health law, counterweight to those fundamental values at times. Um, 
Here's a statement from a court, because we lawyers love statements from courts to kind of back up what we're saying. Um, and this is a, the Supreme Court of Canada in a decision in 2003, citing another court, because that's what judges like to do. They also like to quote judges. And this is developing this, this one principle that I, or, or value that I started with on my last slide, that of autonomy. Just read it, right? So in Starson, they quote a case called Recotch, which is a case that involved an assessment of a woman's uh, capacity. She had MS and was living on, on her own in an apartment. Her capacity to live independently and make financial decisions. An assessor in Ontario went in to her home to make that assessment and made all kinds of what on, in hindsight look like really egregious and obvious errors in making that assessment. Um, and his decision, that assessor's decision, was overturned or invalidated by the court, right? The assessor said, what should you uh, ask me to help her put on a new bra that she had purchased? This is a woman who had mobility impairments. That was, you know, way out. Her apartment was cluttered. It was so messy. It's mobility impairments that she, she couldn't clean it up. She, at one point during the interview, she ate something out of a bag. So, this is the statement that the judge in Rikach made um, in response to the determination that the woman in that case, Ms. Koch, uh, was incapable of making decisions uh, in particular about where to live and regarding her finances. The constitutional guarantee of autonomy protects bodily integrity and the right to make decisions of fundamental personal importance even when those decisions appear risky or foolish. And that, it's that last part that, you know, we're all kind of, it's motherhood and apple pie or what have you to start, but it's, it's when you get the conflict with risk and with what looks like just sheer foolishness um, that the, the hard cases um, arise. So, Finally, we're on to some uh, legal principles that are getting a little closer to my quarry here, uh, the topic of legal capacity. First uh, principle is stemming from that same value that I've been focusing on, uh, autonomy or self-determination, which is prioritized uh, in our legal um, tradition. So at law, it is presumed that all adults are legally capable of making those decisions of fundamental importance to their lives. So that's a presumption. Decisions about health care and personal care may be of fundamental importance or less importance. A presumption in law can be rebutted. It doesn't mean that it stands forever, right? It can be rebutted, but what this means is that the one who wants to challenge that presumption, the status quo, as it were, has to build a case, has to provide the evidence to show um, that that presumption should be overturned. So you need evidence to displace this. That's, it's a really important kind of a sacred principle, that presumption. And the prob, one of the problems that can arise in the world of capacity assessment is kind of speeding off past that um, into the assumption that because a person is older, because they have one of those conditions I listed, or because of something else, they lack uh, legal capacity. So I made this point already. But this is also important to realize. I'm not talking about one coherent concept of legal capacity that we have at law. I'm trying to extract principles out of a number of different um, places that uh, legal capacity is articulated in law. So the definitions vary, again, across jurisdictions, types of decision. Um, there's also variability in terms of who's empowered, who's authorized at law to make a formal assessment of legal capacity. Sometimes it's a tribunal, like in Ontario. Sometimes uh, it's a court, can be a physician, other health professional. So there's a variety of agents involved in these determinations, potentially. Um, back to these central principles, really, this should go with the, the first one, the presumption of legal capacity. Further um, principles of importance is the recognition that legal capacity, the capacity to make decisions, <laughs> for oneself at law um, is or should be an assessment that's decision specific. 
that's very narrowly targeted in terms of what sort of decisions are an issue. And I talked about this, the big divide between personal care decisions, including health care, and financial decisions. That's one big divide that's often recognized. The ability or lack of ability to make decisions about finances is not necessary, does not determine, predetermine the question of whether one's able to make decisions about personal care, but it also gets more fine-grained than that. So my incapacity, according to the existing legal tests, of making a decision about a particular medical treatment, one that, say, is really very complex in terms of the, uh, both the pro procedure itself and the risks and benefits involved and what I have to take into account in order to grasp that. Or maybe there's some other reason that I'm blocked right, from legal capacity in relation to that one treatment, but I may be perfectly capable of making decisions about some other medical intervention, a tetanus shot, some, right, some, something that uh, doesn't fall into the same complexity. It's time sensitive as well. So at law, increasingly it's being recognized that you're not, you know, either capable or incapable for all time. Many of us will fluctuate in and out of these um, uh, states. And that's an important thing to recognize. It's important to recognize as we look at our, our laws, because if our laws tend to rest like a lump with the new status quo, once one, say, is determined to be incapable of X or Y or a whole set of things, if it's really, really hard to displace that, that new status, um, then that seems like a problem. That seems to conflict with our interest in respecting autonomy. And I think that's a problem that is reflected um, in some of our laws here. I've said this already, right? Legal capacity is not equivalent to some medical state or age or some other status. Um, it's also not dependent on the agreement of the person with professional, including medical, advice. It's often the case that fights about legal capacity arise where there's disagreement. In whatever context you want to, you know, law comes to play when people are fighting. Um, and that's as true in the medical context as in um, others. But it's important um, to recognize that disagreement, you know, different values or different opinion than a professional does not count as legal incapacity. Um, on to supported decision making. It's the last of my big background topics. It's what I started with, with the story uh, that I started with. Um, but there's a big political um, dimension to this concept of supported decision making that I can't really start trailing off into the Nova Scotia context without recognizing. I feel personally obliged, politically obliged, and I think as a matter of law, we need to pay attention to the way that values, fundamental values, are shifting here in Nova Scotia and internationally. That's an interactive process. So what's the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities got to do with my topic here, where we're trying to think of how the law in Nova Scotia may affect individuals in Nova Scotia? I'm hoping that there is a relationship so this is, a, a, as I say, a UN convention that Canada ratified a couple of years ago. I say there it had a wide participatory base in its drafting process. It was an unprecedented um, sort of democratic surge at the UN in the sense that there were, whoops, scores and scores and scores of representatives from disability organizations around the, around the world at the sessions in which the convention was, was drafted. People representing uh, these organizations, including folks re representing the psychiatric uh, uh, rights community, as well as persons with developmental disabilities, were involved in drafting the early, uh, the early drafts of this and in the conversations that ensued up until the finalizing of the document. And that participation shows in uh, the language and the, um, the spirit of the document. So what does the document do? It speaks to a whole interactive set of civil and political rights, the right to vote, the right to freedom of association. These are quite familiar to our liberal tradition. Um, the, uh, it speaks to an inter 
action or kind of interlocking relationship of those rights and what are commonly referred to as um, social and economic rights. Okay, so these are rights that include um, education, a right to health, a right to meaningful work, to an adequate standard of living. Wow, what an aspirational document. And this is all positioned around persons with disabilities. So those are the rights holders recognized in this document. And the document puts itself forward as simply um, attempting to apply in a meaningful way to persons with disabilities rights that others enjoy already. These are stated as universal rights. What's the point of this document? What's the relevance? It's you know, an international convention. What's that about? Can I just pick up this piece of paper and go to the local school board and say, here's the convention. You have to you know, give me this. It's not that simple. In fact, there isn't even an international forum uh, given Canada's uh, mode of participating in this convention. There's not even an international forum that we can go to and have a right that we see as being breached under this document remedied by Canada, but we can still use it. And these are the, the two most important ways, I think, for us of thinking about the use of the document. It's relevant to how we read and apply our own laws here in Nova Scotia and in Canada. So there's law in Canada about the status of international law, and it's relevant to the way judges and administrators, like your school board officials, are to interpret and apply um, the laws that we have in Canada and uh, provincially. It's also relevant politically as a means for pressing for reforms. So what is it about the convention that I'm interested in? It's Article 12. Equal recognition before the law is the subheading to that article. And there's three clauses to it, and I'll just spell them out for you. Right, The first um, is the affirmation by the states who signed on to the convention that persons with disabilities have a right to recognition as persons before the law, right? Okay, well, that doesn't sound uh, like uh, it's earth shattering. Secondly, shall recognize that persons with disabilities enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects of life. What that phrase means is hotly contested right now. Um, but it's an aspiration toward the model of supported decision making. What that model is exactly, its implications for domestic law is another question. It's grounded in the value of equality. So equal capacity, on, sorry, legal capacity on an equal basis with others. And here's the direct link to support. The state's party shall take appropriate measures to provide access by persons with disabilities to the support they may require in exercising their legal capacity. So if you think of that judge deciding that first decision that I gave you, it didn't say in that legislation it didn't ha in the legislation, the guardianship legislation being applied in Virginia, there was nothing that mandated supportive decision making in that language. But those lawyers and advocates that came before the judge used this language, drawing explicitly on the convention in order to encourage a modification of the guardianship order that, that recognized this, this principle. Um, Canada has backed off a little bit, ratified the convention, but in relation to Article 12, they wanted to be really clear that their signing on did not mean they were committing to trashing all of our existing guardianship and substitute decision-making laws. And I'm going to do the sort of contrast between substitute decision-making and supported decision-making in a second. Perhaps these can coexist in harmonized fashion, perhaps not. There's broad disagreement on this, but Canada absolutely takes the stance that um, the existing models of substitute decision making we have um, are, do not conflict with the convention. Substitute decision making, supported decision making, this is this language of a paradigm shift that disability advocates around the world have been using with reference to Article 12, which I just um, showed you. And I'm just trying to kind of thematize uh, the sorts of aspirations that are expressed in this idea of a paradigm shift. So if substitute decision making connotes the individual's lack of some, lacking some internal <laughs> peace, right? some internal capacity or room, I guess it would be, right? 
to make uh, his or her own decisions. Supported decision making looks at all decision making as taking place within a framework of supports. So we're talking about for everybody, you know, your education, your emotional and social and economic supports, all of these combine to make you capable of, of decision making. It's a spectrum of how much supports and what types of supports are required. Substitute decision making involves the transfer of decision making authority from one person to another. Supported decision making is more about here's, right, tailoring supports to the individual's needs. If substitute decision making connotes suspicion, surveillance, ultimately coercion, supported decision making connotes respect, assistance, offering of a range of meaningful options. Wow, it's really sort of really dark side and bright side. Maybe it's not so right, uh, necessarily absolutely polarized as this. Maybe it is more of a spectrum. But this is the, uh, the discourse that you should be familiar with. And finally, if substitute decision making positions the individual as a dependent person, as passive, someone whose life is happening to them, as others decide how it should go, that person is a sense, in a sense absent. If you think about the conversation in the doctor's office around even you know, whether well, you know, we're giving the tetanus shot, the conversations going on between the substitute decision maker, whether it be mom or, or dad or, or your child, right, adult child, and the doctor or caregiver, and the one receiving the treatment is just out of the picture. Whereas supported decision making seeks to set up a framework of supports in order to involve the person in the direction of their life. And just a quote from the World Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry, one of the activist groups involved in the drafting of the convention. Here's their uh, description of it. Instead of restricting the autonomy of those who need extra support to comfortably participate in all aspects of life, the CRPD requires states to provide access to such support and respect autonomy. So you get the, you get the picture now. Um, political, not metaphysical. This is just my picture of various other folks who participated in these conversations at the UN. So this idea that legal capacity is a political construct. It responds to this upsurge of political movement among people right, who have been lumped in with the psychiatrized, right? or those with intellectual disabilities and their families who also participated in the drafting um, of, the, of the convention. So it's a political process that's moving us toward this new understanding of legal capacity. We're not trying to approximate some metaphysical sort of ideal of decision-making capacity. And my last word on that, all of the, these arguments kind of fit into uh, the social or human rights model of disability which is sometimes contrasted with a strict medical model of disability. So the sorts of questions that you ask about disability, including legal capacity, are questions like these. So how does the environment and the mental condition of a person interact to produce disability or legal incapacity in this case? How, can, uh, how might conditions under which capacity is being assessed, how might those conditions be impairing the person's ability to demonstrate capacity um, and how can those conditions be altered? <laughs> I said that was the last, but I have to give you something positive. Before we go on to our picture of Nova Scotia law, um, what would it mean to support legal capacity? Well, I've tried to just lay out some broad, um, uh, sort of some scaffolding um, to help us think about that. So there's no uh, one-size-fits-all answer to what it would mean to support decision-making. That's sort of, right? It's individual-specific and context-specific. But certainly the idea of providing a range of meaningful options is one way of supporting decision-making capacity, right? As opposed to, here's your, you know, here's the, here's the choice is one thing. Um, uh, assisting uh, the individual in understanding those options, exploring them, thinking about the consequences, and that could be a family member, a peer, it could be someone designated by the state. Sometimes the help comes uh, in relation, or is necessary in relation to the expression or communication of a choice. Sometimes it's a matter of trying to set 
the tone for deliberation and reflection, and that could involve things like crisis intervention, right? building relationships of trust. Um, and there's a whole set of wider supports that go to supporting legal capacity, and I've just listed a bunch here, which go back to the social and economic rights um, uh, listed in the convention. Um, there are a few legal models, not in Nova Scotia, that are attempting to uh, integrate the idea or ideal of supported decision making into their, um, into their laws. And one that was drawn on in the drafting of the convention and in those conversations a fair bit was BC's uh, Representation Agreement Act. And I don't think anybody, well, except maybe some BC folks, are going to say this is the perfect model. I think that there are um, uh, areas one could critique within that model, and I'm sure it's, it's giving rise to some problems, but it's also a step forward from the prior um, uh, type of model that it's replacing. So that legislation explicitly says that a determination of incapacity is not to be based on the person's way of communicating with others. So it makes that explicit. You might think that's common sense, but it's not necessarily. Um, the law also allows an individual, and this law was crafted with inten in intensive consultation um, with uh, people with uh, developmental disabilities and family members. And that's something to keep in mind. So with this uh, second bullet, right, an individual can appoint a person they trust, and this goes to the third bullet as well, um, to assist them with decisions um, in specific areas. So either to assist them or to make those decisions. It leaves these options of uh, su supported assistance in making decisions or substitute decisions. Um, so that's a type of appointment that an individual adult can make. The capacity to make that appointment is not based on something we're going to see in a second as a kind of typical cognitive ability model of understanding and appreciating the matters in issue. We'll see this in a second. So appreciating the consequences of the decision, understanding all the relevant information. It's a different threshold and it's based on the person's expression of their preferences and their trust in that individual. So it's a different, you might call it a lower, more emotionally or relationally based threshold for making a representation agreement, for appointing a delegate who's going to assist you with decisions or make them on your behalf. There is um, a caveat there though, is that that person who you're appointing because you trust them is not given the authority to authorize actions against your will, where you're willfully um, uh, resisting those. And finally, a representative under this act so one who's been uh, appointed, is mandated to respect the current or contemporaneous wishes of the individual if that's reasonable to do so. Okay? And that's, th this is going to, you'll see the difference between this and our substitute decision-making laws in a second. Um, and the main difference is that in Nova Scotia and in other provinces, the first place one looks when one's making a substitute decision um, is to prior capable wishes. If a person has, you know, at some prior time, while they had capacity to make the decision, indicated their wishes on, the, on a particular issue, then that's going to govern and otherwise you decide in accordance with what you think the person would decide based on their uh, values uh, and your, your knowledge of them. But in BC, Again, this is speaking to the situation of, say, persons with developmental disabilities who may not have some prior capable trumping thing. Um, and the idea is that you are to respect, you as the decision maker are to respect the current wishes of that person if it's reasonable to do so. And there's, of course, some wiggle room on that reasonableness standard. Second model that's sort of touted as advancing supported decision making is one out of Sweden, the idea of a personal ombudsperson. Um, so this is a, a model that was developed in particular uh, in response to persons uh, with psychosocial disabilities, we call it mental health, psychiatric, often isolated, not having family who they might be appointing to right, work on their 
behalf and support them. Um, so folks who were marginalized or isolated in the community. And so this is a model where the state appoints somebody, and that's the personal ombudsperson, um, to meet with the individual and to advocate for their interests. Not just advocate for their interests, but I guess deliberate with them, talk to them, help build decision-making capacity through reflection, through having a sounding board, and then advocate for the person's um, uh, interests. And it's notable there that this ombudsperson acts only at the client's request. So it's not quite the same as, say, you know, a sort of community treatment where someone's going in and forcing something on the individual. Let's look at Nova Scotia. Um, I said that the law relating to legal capacity, decision-making capacity at law, is a little like a, you know, a vase that's shattered and it's in all these various pieces and you're trying to kind of make sense of how they fit together and they don't actually always fit together perfectly. And Nova Scotia is an example of that. So I've just listed the names of a set of statutes, pieces of law, uh, that have been passed provincially in our province um, and that speak to decision-making capacity at law in different ways. Um, and I've bolded the ones that relate to decisions about personal care or health care. The last one there, the Powers of Attorney Act, relates to finances and property decisions only, and I'm kind of putting that off the table. There's also a whole set of statements that judges have made and precedents in law in the common law, right, judge-made law, that speak to particular types of legal capacity, like the capacity to marry or testamentary capacity. These are, and it's, a, it's a rich and complicated world. Um, but more and more, uh, the law's approach to decision-making capacity is, is consolidating around the idea of understanding the matters relevant to the decision, and appreciating right, the implications of those matters for oneself, weighing the risks and benefits. This is forecasting where we're going to go in a second. Some of our laws explicitly state those two prongs of legal capacity, but it's not consistent across um, all, of, all of our laws. And none of our laws, this is a point I want to make near, <laughs> near the end, none of our laws speak to this aspiration of support, right? Speak to the value or the particular, what, sort of mechanism of supported decision making. And I think that's something um, that should change. I'm not going to dwell on my charts. I could stand here all day and tell you I've got two charts. And this is the kind of thing you might flip back to, either if you're just a law nerd or if you're someone that has a particular interest in one or more of these laws. But this is, again, to give you the broken up vase idea. It's complicated. If it sounds simple to you when I talk about legal capacity, then you should second guess me. Um, so these are three of the acts that I had listed there. All I've done in the different columns is, apart from stating the statute's name, I um, list the, the nature of the incapacity that's addressed or defined in that act, and I'm speaking on its own terms, right? Just quoting the act. So the Incompetent Persons Act, right, speaks to uh, uh, what the phenomenon of incapacity from infirmity of mind of managing one's own affairs. I'm going to say in a second, that's, kind of, that's a bit murky in terms of how do you operationalize that. But that's the standard. Um, you know, the court is the one that makes this assessment, the final determination, although they rely on the evidence put to, put to them by physicians. What happens if incapacity is shown? Well, a guardian is appointed by the court, right? So that's SDM stands for substitute decision maker in that fourth column. And what kind of authority does that substitute decision maker have? Well, under the Incompetent Persons Act, that decision maker has authority over the estate and the person of the adult represented. Okay? So, what does that mean? That sounds pretty broad, too. Well, that's going to be my point. But we've got a whole set of other acts that I've run through. I'm never going to get through uh, it all because I just so love all this stuff. I get deep inside it. Um, but I'll give you a taste of some of these other acts as well. And if on your own time you want to come back and admire my chart, uh, you, can, you can do that. The three other statutes that relate to health and personal care decisions in Nova Scotia that I pay, uh, sorry, 
two other powers of attorney act is the one I'm putting off the table because it relates to property and finances. So the other two are the involuntary psychiatric treatment act. It speaks to treatment incapacity, incapacity to make treatment decisions. It defines that. And when that incapacity is established, um, it has a huge impact for, for an individual's um, uh, life and circumstances. Um, Adult Protection Act speaks to another form of incapacity that we'll look at um, in a second. Okay, so just to start with the Incompetent Persons Act, I guess I'm starting with our dinosaur, in a sense. This is a law that has remained essentially unchanged, a little bit of tweaking with the words, right? Took out lunatic and what was the other word? There's another word in this act that people found offensive, so the words were changed. Um, but it's essentially the same as it was in the late 1700s when we inherited this law from England. Um, and we've tried to change it. I'll show you in a second. We had a big law reform commission project around this in the 90s, and they made all these great recommendations to big consultations. Nothing happened, except a little bit of tweaking around the words, um, the terms used. So I'm not going to dwell on this uh, act, um, except to say that, right, I'm just giving you the definition. I already read it to you of the sort of incapacity that's in play in this act. A person, not an infant, so an adult, incapable from infirmity of mind of managing the person's own affairs. That's what the court has to work with and what the applicants have to work with. When, say, a family member, like in the case that I started with, or some other concerned person comes forward, makes an application to the court, and says, I, I should be granted decision-making authority on behalf of this person because they need looking out for. So this is the, st the op sorry, I just bumped that. This is the operative standard that's in play, the test, as it were, that doctors will give evidence, right? in relation to, maybe they'll be using an IQ test, maybe they'll be using the mini mental state, they'll be drawing on what resources they have um, as physicians in order to try and make sense of this legal standard. Again, what happens if uh, the standard's met? There's an award to another, right, to the one who applied, of care and custody of that person and management of their estate. What's the problem? Well, it's, it's a pretty big, vague standard. It's already implicit in the way I've dis, uh, uh, presented it. So both the standard of legal incapacity, as it's stated, it's a bit of a fuzzy-edged right, phenomenon, and also the powers that the guardian has under this act, right? Power over the person and the estate, big. It's, it, it conflicts with the principles that I started with when I was giving you kind of modern principles on legal capacity which uh, tend toward specificity, right, and containing and limiting the area in which the individual's decision-making authority is overridden or usurped, right, a particular treatment or a particular, right? Um, so there's a, there's a problem with that. Act and the Law Reform Commission in 1995 released a report that set out a whole bunch of critiques. I was just looking at them. They still look right today. It doesn't reflect our current social needs or values. You know, the act should require the court to decision the, sorry, to consider the specific types of decisions that are of concern. Uh, the adult's way of communicating, I'm just quoting the law reform report, you know, decades ago. Uh, what available support and resources there are. Um, the wishes of the adult, including those uh, potentially having been expressed in advanced health care dire directive. The act should explicitly require the least restrictive intervention, just pressing forward all of those um, concerns. Um, and, you know, again, quoting, it's, it's like what's new is old. <laughs> the court shouldn't a guard, appoint a guardian unless all alternatives, such as providing support and help, have been tried or carefully considered. Adult Protection Act, another act that we've struggled with over the years in Nova Scotia with processes of revisiting it and critiquing it, and then we're not sure what else to do in order to better respect individuals' liberty, right, um, and equality, while serving those counterweighing values of protection of the vulnerable. How do you strike the balance in that act? And there have been recent reforms to the act um, that I'm going to mostly leave aside because luckily they relate to financial matters, right? So the authority of the state to intervene in an adult's life um, 
where they've been subject to financial abuse is new in this statute, new as of uh, just a few months ago. But here's the definition I'll just write, put to you. Again, big, big sort of understanding, lumpy understanding of uh, legal capacity or incapacity here. So an adult in need of protection is defined in the act as an adult who's the subject of abuse or neglect or self-neglect. I'm summarizing the way that the act puts this forward. Um, further, to be an adult in uh, need of protection, you have to be established to be incapable of protecting or caring for yourself, and here's slightly new language, by reason of permanent physical incapacity or permanent mental incapacity, right? And you refuse or are not able to provide for your protection care. So permanent mental incapacity, again, you're the, either the judge or you're someone giving evidence. What evidence are you giving? This big, this big idea of permanent mental incapacity. The Adult Protection uh, Division has actually set out a whole, gosh, what is it, 500 pages of policy for their adult protection workers on how to, and you can find this online if you're interested. It's wonderful publicly available in that sense, on how to do capacity assessments, how to assess whether an adult is in need of protection. Um, and and these, these issues of incapacity are also quite carefully looked at in the policy, not in law. Uh, so if the minister is satisfied that those criteria are met, then shall assist the adult in an, obtaining services. But there's an alternative. So the alternative is in Section 9.3 of the Act, where the minister can apply to the court, go to court now, for a declaration, not just that the adult's in need of protection, but that they don't have the mental capacity to decide whether to accept the assistance that the government is offering. So that's where legal capacity to decide about personal care and health care comes into play in this act. So the court looks at these you know, broad uh, definitions, and on a best interest basis can issue an order. And the main type of order that's issued under adult protection is that the person be moved out of their home into a nursing home. That's, and I've been involved in work with uh, Joan Harbison over the, at Social Work. She's now emeritus professor who's looked at the adult protection regimes here in Nova Scotia and in other maritime provinces uh, for a while. And our critique is one that there's other orders that can be, can be made, but I'm going to just flip past them now. Our critique um, is that the adult protection regime, as it's stated and as it's implemented in kind of the context of what we continually see as scarce resources, right? it, uh, it tends to emphasize last resort interventions. Wait, 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 till that last moment where the person is in such dire circumstances, living in their own feces and unable practically to speak, if not, that's when you intervene and you scoop the person up and you take them to a nursing home. So I'm putting it dramatically, but this is, in a right large sense, my understanding of the act, rather than earlier on backing it way, way up, offering meaningful supports, including home care, all that, earlier on. So that's the supported model is not, to my mind, at the center of the adult protection regime either. How about the Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act? Well, uh, that's where I've done, in the psychiatric context, is where I've done more of my own work and research, and I am really interested in the question of how supports can be meaningfully offered and deliberated on in relation to persons who end up in psychosocial, psychiatric crisis. That's one of the hard, for me, it's, it's one of those hard cases, hard questions, no easy answers, often no happy endings. Um, but I think we can do a lot better than we do. And our Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act, or IPTA, is an act that emphasizes interventions, right? Hard hitting, last resort, again, like the Adult Protection Act, when things are going really bad, interventions in a person's life. It's just, what else can we do? Look what's happening here. We can't deal with this person. Rather than backing up, and that's what I like to do, and I'm an academic, I'm allowed to do that. I back, I roll back the tape, you know, in the legal cases I look at, and in others, you can think of Ann Derrick's uh, Howard Hyde inquiry. She was backing up the tape, 
right, past that point where Howard Hyde ended up in the circumstance where he was in mental health crisis and was tasered and he ended up dying. What, was, what, was, what can we find in his story to indicate moments when he might have been meaningfully supported? So, IPTA has a set of criteria for involuntary psychiatric hospitalization. One of them is that the person, the last bit there, does not have the capacity to make admission and treatment decisions. That's why it's on my, on my list. That's a criterion. It's a necessary condition of involuntary psychiatric hospitalization. What does that mean? Well, IPTA is an act that, unlike the others that we've just seen, defines it a little more specifically. I like that. I'm a, you know, I like to know what I'm dealing with, at least. I might critique it then, but at least it's spelled out, as is the case with our Hospitals Act, you'll see in a second. So what does all this mean, capacity to make treatment decisions? Well, this law spells it out in terms of those two prongs that I was talking about, understanding the relevant information and appreciating the relevance of that information for one's own case. That's essentially what this big, long list is all about. It specifies, you know, what information is relevant to a treatment decision? Well, you should know the nature of the condition for which the treatment's proposed, the nature and purpose of the specific treatment, specific, right? This is also, it's that limited kind of specific treatment that's an issue. The risks and benefits in undergoing that treatment or not undergoing it. So that's the understanding and appreciation part kind of writ large. I'll unpack the, what's the difference between those two in a sec, just a little more. And finally, whether the, the person's mental disorder affects their ability to fully appreciate the consequences of making that treatment decision. That word fully, that's there. You know, sometimes I think about that and I think of many of the decisions I make, whether it be about fixing my car or having medical treatment, do I fully understand and appreciate all that stuff, that's pretty darn hard. Most doctors don't even try, right, <laughs> to explain it to us because we all know that it's really hard. Um, and yet, that's the test. That's the test that, right, you've got to pass that test in that 72-hour assessment period when you're in mental health crisis and you're at the, at the threshold of involuntary committal. That's a weird circumstance to be in for everybody involved. But I am interested in how you can make sense of supporting decision making, even there. Um, these are just questions that I ask. Is it discriminatory to require full understanding and appreciation of all that stuff in this involuntary psychiatric committal context when that word full is the one thing that's missing in the statement of the test for legal capacity that applies everywhere else, to everyone else? It's a higher expectation at that moment of mental health crisis and potential committal than it is anywhere else. Anyway, consequences are hospitalization, maybe a community treatment order, I don't have time to get into all this. Assignment of a substitute decision maker, right, to make your treatment decisions for you under the terms of the act. It's gonna be a close family member. If you don't have one, it's the public trustee. Hospitals Act. Okay, let me finish up, because I've, I've, it's kind of more of the same now, but I'm getting a little more into some acts that, that get more specific and kind of more interesting to me, although the others I'm more upset about because they're such dinosaurs, in particular Incompetent Persons Act. Um, the Hospitals Act, it's a little like IPTA that we just, just saw, but this relates to decisions about treatment in hospital aside from the involuntary psychiatric situation. So everybody else, your cancer patients, your heart patients, your... You know, everybody who's in hospital, this is the one that applies. A physician makes the assessment. Again, what's the consequence? Well, if you don't meet the test for legal capacity to make the treatment decision an issue, then a substitute decision maker is selected and has to decide in accordance with some statutory standards. Now, this is going to overwhelm you again, but it's basically what you just saw with IPTA, except it lacks that word full or fully. <laughs> So does the patient understand and appreciate the conditions, the treatment, the risks and benefits of undergoing the treatment or not? And then there's that business about appreciation. It's the same language as IPTA. Does your mental condition interfere with your ability to appreciate the consequences of making that decision? Sometimes we translate this in colloquial usage, which I find 
kind of maddening because the colloquial usage is all over the map, but we translate this into the concept of insight. Do you have insight into your condition? Legal case, uh, the same case I had up before, Supreme Court of Canada, kind of unpacked understanding and appreciation a little bit for us. Understand is cognitive, the ability to process, retain, <laughs> tautological, you know, understand. <laughs> you know what we mean, <laughs> Understand. Uh, the relevant information, appreciation, ability to apply it to yourself and weigh the foreseeable risks or benefits. So the, um, one of the examples that uh, Paul Applebaum gives, he's one of the big writers about assessing legal capacity in the United States, and he writes for medical professionals in particular. Um, he tells uh, the story often to make sense of appreciation uh, of a, a woman who... Um, was in hospital and had a gangrenous foot. So, right, the foot's looking really bad and it's changing color and the medical staff need to amputate it. That's their proposal. Um, or else she's going to lose her entire leg and possibly die. Um, and she can report back what this condition is in the abstract. She can describe it as well as you like and remember all that stuff. Um, but she refuses to recognize that her foot is gangrenous. And she says, it's just dirty. And she keeps trying to wash it. So that's an example that's given of failure to appreciate the kind of thing that can go on in a right? In, for so many complicated reasons in different areas of life. But this is one kind of simple example um, where she would have not met that test for legal capacity. Okay. Um, now, you might come back and say, gee, what could we have done to read? Could we have got a family member into Maybe she's scared as all hell of losing her foot and her leg, and she's deny, 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 as many of us do, whether it's cancer or, you know, you may know family members. It's just, how did you not get that thing looked after? These are common human frailties. Can we address them? Or do we just, you know, set off the incapacity alarm bell? I'm not going to, I'm running out of time, so I just want to make sure, clear that out of that same case, Starson and, and Swayze, they articulated a couple principles. And one is this. This goes back to supported decision making. So where a person is evincing is showing a failure to understand or appreciate uh, that information, don't necessarily assume that they're unable. Look to how good was my imparting of the information here. There's lots of studies that show re-educating, say, older adults and, and others over, you know, separate uh, encounters way improves their scores on this, on this stuff. So have I imparted it in a way the person can understand? Are they sedated? I've seen cases, Ontario Cap Consent and Capacity Board, where the person was under sedation, where they were undergoing their capacity test. And it's, it's so sort of pro forma. But like, those are obvious examples, but there are others, emotional and other circumstances, that may interfere. Um, also ensure that it's not disagreement, differences of values or opinions that's driving the assessment. And this is, I just want to give you this other example because it's a Nova Scotia one, Recruit. Uh, this is a case where a 25-year-old guy was in a correctional facility and he was diagnosed with testicular cancer. He actually had one testicle removed at birth. So he's got, you know, he's tested. He didn't know this, though, at the time that his capacity was assessed, his capacity to make treatment decisions was assessed. He was being shipped off to the hospital to get all this stuff looked to, he had a capacity assessment, but there hadn't been uh, an adequate informing, right, of the condition that was an issue and the treatment proposed at the time of the assessment. That's a bad assessment, right? You know, if you don't inform, and I mean, we had great people involved in this case, but it shows how hard on the spot it can be to do this stuff um, right. And secondly, there was a second assessment done after he had been informed, and he was freaking out. He was chained to a hospital bed, is this right, per flight risk. He did have a delusional disorder of some kind in the background, so some of that's driving, right, this weird case. But um, he was freaking out, and the judge said, hold on, you have to take into account that the guy was really emotional here, and that's going to interfere with his ability to meet the test. So kind of same sort of message. Whoops, that's really a weird, I don't know how that happened.
Uh, but uh, legal safeguards, that's just summarizing some of the stuff that I've been saying about how you can try and work in support um, to existing laws around um, legal incapacity. You know, So inform people not just about the intervention that's an issue, that's this informed down here, but also, or these legal capacity tests are an issue, inform them of the nature and purpose of the assessment. This is a requirement in Ontario law. It's been stated in an Ontario case, and I think it makes good legal sense here. I mean, think about it. If you have a medical professional or other approaching you, let's have a conversation about your condition. You may be half asleep and not care and say, you should know what an impact this conversation may have on your right to make decisions for yourself. So that's important. And if you're undergoing a capacity assessment, right, maybe you don't know and then you realize that let, that's a point that you could challenge on. All of these points, you, either you or you on behalf of a loved one, right? Address those, the circumstances that may interfere with your capacity to decide should be addressed, right? Inform, reinform, reinforce, probe. So this is my, right, this is my slide for professionals often. So if they get a response that's just not making sense, you know, I don't want this treatment, I've got to feed my cat, something like, you know, I've got to go home and probe, figure out what's going on, what's the emotional or other, what's the value that's driving a response that might seem to you completely um, irrational. The, a person's insistence, they want to stay in their own home, right, despite clear and obvious risks to them of staying in their own home. Um, and finally, you can consult corollary sources. Um, I'm going to have to, I was going to tell you a little bit about those other acts that I have, but for one thing, my computer seems totally frozen. Oh, there it is. Um, you know, uh, but I'm going to have to um, give you a little bit of time to ask me some questions. If you bear with me, I'm just so that you have a sense of like the array of things you might want to talk about or ask about. I was going to, you know, prepared to talk a little bit about who is the substitute decision maker if you don't meet the test of legal capacity under the Hospitals Act. It's giving you some laws there. And I was also going to talk a little bit, and I, you can come back to the slides, you can think about a really important piece of legislation in Nova Scotia called the Personal Directives Act, which both recognizes the legal force of advanced directives re relating to personal care in this um, province, and the power that we all have to make advanced directives indicating our wishes or our values regarding both health care and personal care is an important one to think about and talk about with each other. So it's not something I actually want to just um, skip over. Um, it does go to the value of autonomy uh, that is, um, I think, should be at the core of our thinking about this. Right? This is just a list of what personal care involves under the Act. The test for capacity, very similar. The understanding and appreciation prongs. Um, this act also speaks to people who have no advanced directive, right? Their situation outside hospital, um, where they may be incapable of making decisions in three areas, health care, placement in a continuing care home, and home care services. It's really an important area, especially that second one, placement in a continuing care home. So you're outside hospital, you're someone who may be having trouble at home. Who's going to make this assessment and how's it going to be made? You want to stay home and the neighbors are worried. Your daughter is worried. It's, it's obviously a, a, a really important area to look at. Last year I was called up by the, uh, some emergency rounds uh, folks at one of our hospitals because they were really concerned. They had been... Uh, asked, and they were being asked continually, to assess what were presented as frail elderly, brought into the emergency ward, maybe sitting there overnight under the fluorescent lights, right? Assess them for their capacity to decide to live independently. So there's the dogs throwing up their hands saying, how can, how can I even start? I'm, I have no idea of this person's context of living. I have no, I, I don't need, I haven't been trained in this. And, and those docs were being asked to sign off on the form 
that would then place that person in a continuing care home. That's kind of a worst case type description of what's happening under the um, Personal Care Act. But there are ways that I think we could support those types of decisions as well in this slide. I'll just leave you with this. Um, uh, in terms of you know, the types of questions that can be asked in order to make sense of these assessments. Um, but also, right, the same sorts of values that I just, uh, or in, um, approaches that I just spoke to with relation to treatment decisions map onto um, these sorts of decisions uh, as well. And so do the same, so do the points about supported decision making, both in the very personal, right, the, the, the relational interaction of the one assessing and the one being assessed. How can that one assessing support or bring in others who can support? But I don't want to forget that wider uh, context of social and economic supports and opportunities. These include train, uh, training for those professionals who are asked to do these assessments, right? Um, protocols, <laughs> right? To ensure that these assessments are done fairly, um, as well as that whole sort of wider aspirational idea of offering people in the first place meaningful support so they don't get into that last resort um, pickle. All right, I'm going to stop there because I better stop somewhere, um, even though I could go on. Anyone want to talk about uh, any of this stuff? Yeah, please. Um, I have a question about uh, mental illness. And, yeah. Um, I don't know about the acts and stuff, but when somebody can be deemed like incapable of making their own decision, would it depend on the mental illness they have if it was managed by medications or I'm I'm just wondering about mental illness is the best way. Um the fact that one has been diagnosed with a particular mental um, illness or condition, kind of like I said earlier on. It's not determinative. It's not a one-to-one, -one, no matter what the illness is. Although, right, uh, folks with uh, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder often find themselves more, right, more frequently in uh, situations in which their treatment decision-making capacity is called into question. And sometimes we see this happening, you know, this sort of the story of someone who's managed on medications, then goes off the medication. But I want to avoid a story, the very frequent story that we, that we tell um, about compliance or non-compliance with medication and then mapping that one-to-one -one onto capacity and incapacity. You're capable if you're complying. You're incapable if you're not complying. And I'll just point you again to something I mentioned earlier, Justice and Derek's um, report uh, on the, the Hyde inquiry. So she did an inquiry into the death of Howard Hyde. And one of the things that she looked at was Howard Hyde's frequent uh, going off his meds, right? And she asked the question, which is, this, right? Why? Why was he going off his meds? And he had a bad time with some of the medicine. There, there are rational, right? <laughs> Or at least, maybe rational is the wrong word, but you can sympathize humanly with the decision. And it's not always the case that you need X medication to maintain capacity. So, I want to avoid that story, but at the same time, note that sure, there's a, there's a, a link um, between some mental disorders and the frequency with which one's incapacity is challenged. Yeah. I'm wondering how freedom of religion interacts with substituted um, decision makers. Um, both on the grand scale with transplants and transfusions, and even on a, a lower scale with personal improvements, such as cutting hair, cutting facial hair, um, when that imposes on the freedom of religion of the uh, person who's having decisions. Yeah, I think, well, that's a, a great question. One of our big uh, legal precedents came out of Ontario, was one that related to a Jehovah's Witness who had a card that she had written out, I think some years before, saying, I think it was simply no blood. Um, and she had had an accident, she was unconscious, and the question was, could they transfuse or not? If I remember rightly, they transfused, but then the doctor got hit with having essentially committed a battery. He acted against the refusal, as indicated in her directive there, 
as based in her religious beliefs, right? Um, he'd acted against that. Now, you could unpack that. She didn't need to rely on freedom of religion in order to make her case. It was autonomy and all those principles we just saw about, you know, my right to determine what's done with my body, whether it's for a purely irrational reason or a religious, you know, reason. But I think what you're getting at is the potential for the, the alarm bells to start going off, maybe you are, on the uh, health professional's um, side, where the health professional is not quite getting to that religious basis and sees it as simply irrational. You know, don't cut my hair, don't. Um, and and there's, a, there's a long history of kind of trying to separate out what is the difference between a religious belief and a delusion, and a delusional system. And, you know, right? And you try and link it up to, well, you know, they've got a community of belief, and you've got a culture of belief, and all this sort of, right? As opposed to a really... But there's an interesting literature on that very and I'm question. And specifically for the, the um, substitute uh, decision maker, whether it's like a family member or something like that, if they have any kind of uh, guidelines or if there's any kind of recourse against a decision maker who ignores the wishes of, you know, it's just you're talking straight to the doctor and the, the person whose body is in question is not involved in the conversation, um, whether that substitute decision maker can be if the substitute disobeys the yes. religious wishes of the person who is not conscious, say, yes. is there recourse against the substitute decision maker? Or even okay. the person who is conscious, but is, is not right. Yeah, it's, it's a really important um, question. I also want to say, though, I forgot to say, <clears throat> that there is also a whole literature, you know, it's between religion and religious. It's a whole literature and a whole versioning important interest in cultural competency among health professionals uh, in interacting with their clients. It adds a whole new layer and dimension to, uh, to these assessments. So your, your second question, though, as to mechanisms for challenging a substitute decision maker, in um, Nova Scotia, uh, one can go to the court. Wait a second. If I'm unconscious, if I'm otherwise difficulty, how do I get the application to the court going in order to challenge my substitute decision maker? There's a few complexities around your question, even that go to the way the court's oversight, oversight powers are phrased in our Hospitals Act, in our IFTA Act, just what kind of oversight of the substitute decision maker um, is to be made, but I was going to at one point mention the rules, essentially, that are set out for substitute decision makers, this is what you would look to, you point to as the person who's had a decision made on your behalf, and you're saying, no, 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 that's not it, which is often the case, talking about these vague literatures, whether it be differences in religious opinion or other reasons, there is a literature that shows family members often depart from even the clear prior advanced directives and wishes of their of their loved ones, whether around end of life or other matters. Well, what's with that? It's a complicated set of affairs. But in terms of law, um, here's the expectation, right, that a substitute decision maker, once in capacity to shown and they're duly appointed, should decide in accordance with the patient's prior capable wishes, so their prior express wishes. That could be in the form of an advanced directive written out, or it could be just something that was orally transmitted while the person was capable. That's the first thing. Decide in accordance with that. So if your person made their wishes known, that's what the substitute's supposed to decide. In light of, there's a little bit of uh, uh, complication of that that goes to whether those wishes are applicable in the circumstances. I'll skip over that, but it's really interesting. Uh, but if you don't have a prior express wish, then the next default, right, is that the substitute is to decide in accordance with what he or she believes the wishes of the patient would be based on what the substitute knows of the values and beliefs of the patient and from any other right instructions. So that goes to your, that's what the law says the person should do. And then the question is, well, how can you challenge it under this act? It's a mechanism where a court can review it. Courts are not always easy to access, just an access to justice point of view. It's also, under the Personal Directives Act, a court that's authorized to 
second guess to oversee both assessments of incapacity um, and the decisions made by substitutes. How does that person who's in the continuing care home get that application going is my question. And one of my, um, I guess, suggestions <laughs> for law reform uh, would go to making those processes more accessible, whether through creating an administrative tribunal that's designed to be effective and accessible, right? Or an expedited court process, but also through maybe processes like these, but other forms of commu communication um, to the public about what people's rights are. There was someone over there, yeah. You know, it's too, so far, it's, it's such an abstract case that you've presented. Um, it's got no context. So, so far, I'd say, um, let's talk about this further. <laughs> um, and then I'd want to get into the question of whether there are alternatives that are more I guess less restrictive of that individual's liberty and autonomy and developing one hopes, but let's hear more about the situation, capacities to make decisions for themselves. And then if they were to say, I've got, I've got these safety concerns, I've got right, these concerns are deep, then I would encourage them when making that application to kind of join with this autonomy respecting movement, I suppose, and even in the context of that application, only ask for what is necessary to, right, as a defensible, right, in a defensible sense, to the, to the best interests of that individual. You know? Um, so contain, as much as possible, the sorts of decision-making powers being asked for, and leave the rest. As opposed, so let's ask judges to be clear in their orders under the Act of what the areas of guardianship are and are not. I guess I'm, that's another. Because it's an expensive yeah. process. And I yes, think, it is. Um, so, what particular, can you think of very particular areas that you would recommend it? I know that clients are very different, but. This is the kind of situation where an academic steps back and says, you might want to talk to a lawyer. So that you've got, right? So that, that I don't want to be going astray and t talking off the top of my head way outside the specific context of that person's circumstances and needs. Both the child's, uh, adult child now, uh, and the parents. I've given you my arguments to say that I think our laws could be reformed to open up more options for people and to allow us to see the opportunities for supporting decision making. Not just the law, right? Law reform can't do that work on its own. You need a commitment in housing policies, right? Distributive justice, right? Um, policies where disability is not regarded as an afterthought, right? Once the money's run out. Some, uh, yeah. Or there's law that looks at capacity in such detail like this. Why is it important that there is a line at 18 or a line to decide who's an adult and who's a minor instead of just applying the same general capacity test to everybody? Well, the law on mature minors is also not consistent okay. across the country. So I use this word mature minors. Um, so it's not always the case that a strict line is, is drawn and you're incapable before this age, incapable after, you know, after it. Uh, so the mature uh, minor test, the, what changes is the presumption. So with adults, we presume that you're capable and we operate on that assumption, presumption, unless it's rebutted. With minors, it's the, it's the opposite. We're gonna presume that your autonomy capacities are developing. Right, and your capacity to make decisions for yourself is developing. Um, but there is case law that directs um, the assessment of minors to see if they do meet 
those tests, and it's the teenage years in particular, and we have you know some case law around really difficult decisions, whether it be blood transfusion, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, or other less, you know, life changing. Okay. It's a good question, but it's another whole thing okay. to unpack. This is a bit outside of the legal context, but I know you've written on social justice as well. And to what extent do you think uh, declarations of incapacity are uh, gendered or racialized or imposed more frequently on the poor who, who don't have access to legal redress more often than um, people from other classes? Yeah, it's a, it's a really um, important question and one that um, needs to be looked at more, and it has been looked at in the past, and there are sometimes fights and uh, about the data, and, but one of my earliest ways of engaging with this uh, topic was through the writing of a, an American feminist who um, uh, was looking at women's experience in particular under guardianship and assessments. And Barbara Secker is a, a bioethicist here in Canada who did similar work at that time. So Barbara, for instance, was writing about financial capacity assessments um, in the context of older women who may not have been involved in kind of running the household affairs. Um, and so this kind of supported model um, and also recognizing that some people need supports, maybe relying on others, but the move to simply um, usurping decision-making, taking away all decision-making authority from, say, that woman who for various you know, gendered reasons has been outside that area of activity. Um, that's a problem. That is a social pro justice problem and equality. It has a different dimension to it than simply the autonomy dimension. Um, racialized, there's work in the states uh, around uh, black men in particular uh, being uh, subject to involuntary hospitalization uh, with more frequency, and with that comes incapacity determination. We've got some great um, work that, uh, out of Quebec around cultural competency and capacity assessments that starts to sort of show um, how, much, um, how, how much difficulty there is in bridging deep cultural um, gaps, so cultural difference here, whether it be religious beliefs or other beliefs around you know, what the doc might diagnose one way and the person understands another. How do you bridge these deep differences, cultural differences in understanding? So there is always an equality dimension to these questions um, that you need to be, I guess, conscious of in the individual circumstance, but necessarily systemically as well uh, as we roll up this. If I, if I understand correctly, uh, there were uh, times since where the, the competencies that have assessed and that person can be deemed incompetent outside of the court that you know, happened here in a hospital yes. or a doctor's office. So, um, so I guess I, I wonder sort of who is there to uh, kind of go to the access of justice and you talked about that somebody knows that they're being assessed and what the consequences of that assessment are. Who is there within the system to um, advocate and protect the interests of that individual other than the family or the well-intentioned professionals. Um, does that, I, I remember hearing about a mental health advocate sort of program that, I don't know where that's at right now, um, but is that set in legislation or is that really just up to um, social services? In the uh, in voluntary psychiatric hospitalization context, there are, now I'm forgetting the terms of mental health advocates, they're not giving legal advice, but they're trying to facilitate, you know, your access to that advice if you want it. Uh, I think that a, a whole lot better job could be done both in that context, which is a smaller, sort of rarefied, but very intense and important context, and in the broader context, whether within hospital, where some of this stuff, I mean, it's happening as a conversation among the treatment team. It's often not just the doc who may be coming and seeing a person for, you know, five minutes a day or so. It's, you know, the conversation and 
this is how professionals are educated to do these assessments, is among the nurses and the others who've interacted with the person, maybe with a family member. So maybe in that crew there's someone advocating saying, hold on, maybe we should actually address the person and tell them we're doing this assessment, but not necessarily. It's not as clearly... There isn't someone yeah. outside the system that can be sort of called in... An ombuds-type person? Party, no. I mean, we have the ombuds person, but that's not their specific role. Now, some people are going, and I think I've got to yeah, <laughs> shut this party down. I'll let Kim do it. <laughs> Maybe I can just thank you for coming this evening and thank Sheila for her remarks, and I'm sure she's willing to stick around for another couple of minutes for those of you that still have a burning question or two left. Thank you. Thanks a lot for listening.